Good morning, everyone. And you're good morning. You're all welcome to Sunday school. It's good to, to be here this morning. Um, we're gonna start our Sunday school by singing My God is so big. And after the song, we're gonna ask um Brother Alan Smith from our Portland Church to please open us in prayer. Thank you. Lord, we just praise and thank you for this morning, Lord God. You ask that you just be with us now as we study your word, Lord God. Bless and anoint our teacher, Lord, today, Lord God, and help us, Lord, to all to draw a little closer to you and to learn more about you. For we know you are the one that gives us life, breath, and we know that you will guide us through this day. Bless those, O oh Lord, that uh, are listening today or uh, participating today. Bless those, O oh Lord God, that are are there this morning. And Lord, we ask, especially this morning, you be with those that are in need this morning. Those who are suffering from sicknesses and all of the other plagues that are on us today. We ask that you guide our footsteps today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Sir, uh, it's time for our memory verse drill. Um, Josephine, are you going to read your memory verse, please? Yeah. Thank you. Good job. God bless you. Um, Samuel, are you ready for your memory verse? If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. John 13, 17. Thank you. God bless you. And Brother Joseph Equivy. Are uh, you ready? Yeah, I am. Thank you. Yeah. Um, have not I commanded thee, um, be strong and have a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, with us, whoever thou goest. Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. Amen. We thank God for his promise. Um, at this point, I'm going to hand over to our pastor, Brother Adishabha. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday School. Um, thank you so very much, Sister Han, and all those who recited the, uh, the uh, memory verses or the key verses. I want to say happy Valentine's Day to you all. We thank God for the love of God, uh, that love that has been shared abroad in our heart. And the love that has made us, the love of God that has compelled us to be at, in Sunday school this morning. Thank you so very much uh, for being here. God bless each and every one of you. We want to welcome everyone to uh, the Sunday school lesson, especially those from our headquarters church uh, in Portland, from different parts of the United States, Africa, uh, Europe, as well as Canada. May God bless each and every one of you today. If you have any prayer requests, please kindly put those in the chat window in Zoom. We will be sure to pray over those requests and also forward them to our headquarters church where many around the world would uh, bring those requests to God in prayer. Considering we all want to enjoy the lesson, please kindly mute yourself when you are not talking um, we know, and if you do need to make contributions, I, we are sure that Brother Mark is all up for contributions. Uh, please put up your hand or make those contributions via the chat window, and we will be sure to harvest those contributions and uh, bring them to the class. Thank you once again. We have a beautiful lesson this morning titled Conquering the Land. Reverend Mark Stoller who is the pastor of our church in Tehachapi, Peak, California. And Brother Mark, uh, we thank God for opening the churches in California. 
<laughs> so that you folks can have service. Uh, we'll be our teacher this morning. We welcome, we all know Brother Mark, and we welcome him and his good wife, Sister Sylvia, again to our midst. Brother Mark, over to you, sir. Thank you, Brother Oak. Is my volume okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, sir. Excellent. I am on the road today. Instead of being in Tehachapi, California, I traveled to the Bay Area with my wife and my father. And for Valentine's weekend, we visited our adult children and our granddaughters. So I want to give a shout out to Gordon and Evelyn Olson, who hosted us and let us stay at their house a couple of nights. And the Richmond Saints in California are starting their first indoor church service today. Our Tehachapi Church, we're starting next Sunday. So we've been off for Oh, it seems like months, and we're going to be, we're so excited to start indoor services next Sunday. Uh, I see uh, Tom and Vicki Udo from Bakersfield. Hi, Tom and Vicki. Good to see you. They're doing our uh, church prayer and share today at 1230, so they're going to pray and, and check in with all the Tehachapi Saints since I'm on the road. Uh, Brother O, I understand that you folks in Oregon and Washington have gotten lots of snow lately. Is that true? Yes, uh, we, we have lots of snow around here. And as well as uh, Langley, I, I had a Langley had an outpouring yesterday too. Is that affecting your church services today? I'm wondering if Portland and Washington are having church services. We are. I can, Brother Hell is not I think they are going to, we are going to be holding services. Um, we've gone out. Uh, driven around the road and the roads have been taken care of so we will go ahead and have service this morning. Excellent. I saw Brother Earl shaking his head though Portland is closed today. Is that right Brother Earl? Yeah I heard you had almost a 12 inch almost a foot of snow in Portland. That's amazing. Uh, Brother Mark it's the ice. We had snow then ice on top of that and then snow on top of that. Now we got ice on top of that this morning. <laughs> One of those famous Portland ice storms. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, I'm checking in with some folks on the West Coast, but I know there are folks back East and in Africa and around the world that are tuning in today. So welcome to our adult Sunday school lesson. Uh, Brother Mark, Yakima is here this morning. The Sister Linda said Yakima has lots of snow and church council this morning. Okay. So I'm going to hold up on screen our schedule. So you see on my camera, we're only three lessons to go in this winter session. We've worked our way through some of the five books of Moses, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now we're leaving the five books of Moses, and we're in the six books of the Old Testament, the book of Joshua, as the children of Israel are entering into the promised land. And there's three lessons on Joshua. I get, I get the privilege of doing the first one today. Conquering the Land, chapters one through eight. Brother O, I'm going to put you on the spot. Who's our teacher for next week, claiming God's promises, Joshua 13 to 21? Brother Samuel Oni has been appointed to teach us next Sunday by God's grace. Excellent. And then our final lesson, the last Sunday of February, committing to faithful service, Joshua 23 and 24. I will get, I only think a week ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you were going to say, it's me, Brother Mark. Brother O is going to wrap it all up. <laughs> Maybe I'll make that request of Portland. Ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, hasn't this been a wonderful series? I just really, really have enjoyed going through uh, the books of Moses. And I'm looking forward to looking closer at Joshua today. Uh, in uh, March, we're starting a new unit, and it's, we're going to go to the New Testament. So I think we're going to look at several. I think it's the book of Matthew and several other uh, New Testament letters. So if you've been enjoying these studies, keep, keep attending, and we'll be switching over to some New Testament studies starting in March. Brother so, Mark, I yes. just checked. So sorry. I just checked now, uh, Brother uh, Bob Dami's email. Reverend Sam Ajayi will teach us in two weeks. Excellent. So Brother Sam will wrap up this winter series from uh, the books of Moses and the book of Joshua. I'm going to try to share my screen now so I can give you an overview of the book of Joshua. Let's see if I can get this to work from current slide. Excellent. Can you see my screen okay? 
Brother O says yes. So this is an overview of the Old Testament book of Joshua. The book is named for Moses' successor who led the Israelites into Canaan. Joshua or Hoshua, Hoshea is a Hebrew name meaning Jehovah saves. In fact, it is a variant of the name Jesus. So uh, Joshua was the savior of uh, the Israelites being their general leader that led them into the promised land. And Jesus is our savior from sin. Okay. What type of book is Joshua? It is the first book of history after the Pentateuch. It's one of three Old Testament uh, books set in the time before the kings. So altogether, there are 17 books of history, the five books of Moses, and 12 other Old Testament books of history. So if you're trying to remember these books of history, remember three history books before the time of the kings, Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. During the time of the kings, six history books, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles. And after the time of the kings, three post-kings history books, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. So here we have the first of the 12 history books in the Old Testament after the five books of Moses. I'm trying to advance my screen now. Okay, who wrote this book? It's traditionally ascribed to Joshua. Internal evidence indicates that portions of Joshua were written at a later date. You'll see it's written in Joshua sometimes, and this is so to this very day, indicating that some of, some of the writing was done at a later date. So that's some internal evidence that we have to pay attention to. The original audience for this book, uh, the book of Joshua was written for the Hebrews whose ancestors conquered and settled Canaan land or the promised land. The book was written approximately 1370 BC. So if we assume Joshua was writing portions of this book, doing kind of an account of the, what was happening, that would have been written in 1370 BC. The events described occur with the entry into the promised land of Canaan and ends with the death of Joshua. So the book of Joshua covers a period of about Oh, 30 years from 1400 BC entering into the promised land to the death of Joshua about 1370 BC. Where did the events described occur? At the beginning of the book of Joshua, Joshua and the Israelites, now help me out, I think I might've got the wrong side of the Jordan River. Did they come through on the west side of the Jordan or the east side of the Jordan River? I'm, I saw that and I typed this up a while ago, but I'm thinking they might have come on the east side of the Jordan River. And so they have to cross the Jordan to get into the promised land. They, they then entered into and conquered and divided up Canaan land, a geographical area that was about 180 miles long and about 40 miles wide. So that's the geography of the book of Joshua. There are 24 books, uh, 20, excuse me, 24 chapters in the book of Joshua. So it's one of the shorter books of, of uh, the Old Testament history books in terms of chapters. There are two major sections in the book of Joshua. The first section, chapters 1 through 13, describes how the Israelites entered into and conquered Canaan land. So entering in and conquering the land about halfway through. And then the last uh, chapters, 14 through 24, describes the way that Canaan land was divided up and settled. So I like to get a, just a simple structure for each book of the Bible in my mind to help remember the, the events of each book of the Bible. Why was this book written? Joshua is written to document how God kept his covenant promises to Abraham and his offspring. So it gives us, gives us a couple of scriptures. I'll, I'll in, uh, reference those real quickly here. I'll turn to Joshua 21, 45. Give me a second here. Joshua 21, 45 says, there failed not one of any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel, all came to pass. 
And then in Joshua 23, 14, it's written, and behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth, and ye know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. Those are some of Joshua's last words. The book of Joshua also demonstrates how um, um, some of my words are covered by the picture, so I can't read it clearly. Uh, how obedience brings God's blessings and how disobedience and unbelief brings God's punishment. And that's a lesson we see over and over again in the books of Moses and among the, the, the history of the children of Israel. Since we're Christians reading the Old Testament, I always like to uh, put on at the end of every uh, Old Testament book that I'm studying, where can you see Jesus Christ in Joshua? Where can you see Jesus Christ in Joshua? Some people see Jesus in uh, uh, Joshua 5, 13 through 15. And that is when the captain of the host of the Lord appears to Joshua. And some people feel like this might be a, uh, an appearance of Jesus to Joshua. It says Joshua bowed and worshiped this captain of the host of the Lord. Again, uh, Jesus appears in the book of Joshua, just in the name Joshua is the same as Jesus. So Jesus in the Greek is the equivalent of Joshua in the Hebrews. You can also say that Joshua is a type of the king of kings. I don't know how you think of Jesus. Sometimes we think of him as uh, the good shepherd. But if you look at Revelation 19, he's the warrior king coming back on the white horse. And so uh, Joshua is that warrior leader also. So there's some ways you can think of uh, the foreshadowing of Jesus in the book of Joshua. I'll stop sharing my screen and that finishes up the overview of the book of Joshua. I've got uh, three uh, lesson questions where I want you to be willing to share with me. So if you're uh, thinking ahead, uh, the first time I'd like to get some feedback from you folks is, um, question number two, uh, excuse me, at the end of, okay, I want you to think about after question two, Examples of how God's moving in the lives of other Christians has encouraged you in your own Christian walk. So that's one thing I want you to be ready to testify of. Who are some people in your life, some Christians that have inspired you? So I'm going to give you a chance to honor some of your Christian elders this morning. So be praying and thinking, who is someone I want to honor today that has inspired me in my Christian walk? And then for question number four, um, it says, take time to remember God's blessing and to share these blessings with others. I want you to think about how God has blessed your particular local church. So what memorial stone do you want to erect to remember how God has worked in your church? And then finally, for question eight, it says, um, what acts of obedience and worship should we as Christians be careful to perform even as we face the battles of life? So be thinking of those three questions, and that's where I'm going to ask for the most audience participation today, okay? Okay. Um, I'm using my, uh, my daughter's equipment, and uh, I'm not used to using the headset, so I'm, I'm not hearing anyone respond. Is anyone responding verbally to me, or are you just listening and shaking your heads? Okay, but there will be a chance when you will be able to activate your microphones and participate also. So... Diving into today's lesson, we got the first eight chapters of Joshua. In chapter one, God calls Joshua to be the new leader. In chapter two, Joshua sends the spies into uh, Jericho and the two spies are hidden by Rahab and the promise is made to Rahab that her and her family will be spared. In Joshua chapter three, the Joshua and the children of Israel cross the Jordan River miraculously in chapter four, they set up memorial stones to remember how God led them through the Jordan River into the promised land. In chapter five, 
the uh, ordinance of, of circumcision and Passover are reinstated. Chapter six is the famous battle of Jericho. Uh, chapter seven is the sin of Achan and the defeat at the second battle of Ai. And today's lesson ends with chapter eight, our, uh, the Israelites victory at Ai. So there's a quick overview of the first eight chapters of Joshua. Now, our first question for today says, how do you think Joshua may have felt when God called him to lead the children of Israel into Canaan? Briefly describe the ways that Joshua was encouraged directly or indirectly before he led the children of Israel into battle. And the uh, teacher's guide did a great job giving us about five scripture references to show you what an encouraging God we serve. So if you have your Bibles, get ready to read along. So this was a big job that God gave to Joshua. First of all, he's following Moses' footsteps, and that's quite the act to follow. They're entering into Canaan land, which, remember, 40 years before, the 10 spies said, there's no way we can take this land. There's high-walled cities. There's giants in the land. How could we ever take this land? And here, Joshua is tasked with going in. I think uh, towards the end of Joshua, there's a chapter that lists all the battles that Joshua was a general over 31 kings that Joshua defeated. So what a task God had given him. But I want you to remember that this lesson is teaching us along with the task that God gives us, he gives us plenty of encouragement. So if you're in uh, chapter one, here's what God says to Joshua at the end, uh, towards the end of chapter one, starting at verse five. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. And then uh, I love verse eight. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. The memory verse for the adults was Joshua 1, 9. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. When I was a younger man and I read some, read some of those be not afraid verses, I always in the back of my mind thought that God was scolding the people that he was saying that to. You shouldn't be afraid. You shouldn't be afraid. And I realized as I grew up and became a more mature Christian, God is really an encouraging God. He truly was not scolding Joshua. He was just telling him, don't be afraid. I'm on your side. Uh, in the end of chapter one, not only does God encourage Joshua, but his followers, the Israelites encourage him. So look at the 16th verse of chapter one. The, I think it's the two and a half tribes answer Joshua saying, all that thou commandest us, we will do. And whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go. According as we hearken unto Moses in all things, so will we hearken unto thee. Only the Lord thy God be with thee as he was with Moses. Whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment and will not hearken unto thy words and all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death. Only be strong and of a good courage. Wouldn't that be encouraging if you were leading a group of people and they said, we're behind you. We will obey you. Uh, don't be afraid. We're your people. So I so appreciate the saints in Tehachapi. I've been in Tehachapi almost 25 years. And the, the children of God there are so supportive. I'm glad they haven't uh, told me they're going to stone anyone to death if they don't obey me. But uh, I'm so glad that they are such a nice group of people to work with. You... Um, Remember the spies that went into Jericho and that spared Rahab's life? What was their report that they gave to Joshua? Turn to the uh, end of the second chapter. And here's what the spies say to Joshua, starting at the 23rd verse. So the two men returned and descended from the mountain and passed over 
and came to Joshua the son of Nun and told him all things that befell them. And they said unto Joshua, truly the Lord hath delivered into our hands all the land for even all the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. God encouraged Joshua, the tribes encouraged Joshua, the spies encouraged Joshua. And then in chapter three, God magnifies Joshua in front of the children of Israel by having the rivers of uh, the Jordan River part. And we read in uh, the, four, the fourth chapter, I believe it is, the 14th verse after the parting of the rivers have occurred and they're setting up in the memorial stones. Joshua 4, 14 says, on that day, the Lord magnified Joshua in the sight of all Israel and they feared him as they feared Moses all the days of his life. So God encouraged Joshua, not just with words of himself and others, but also with the uh, events that occurred in his life. Uh, the, the teacher's guide didn't mention Joshua 5, uh, the end of chapter 5, but turn to chapter 5. It's just an amazing appearance of the Lord of hosts to Joshua. And that's the 13th through 15th verses. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, nay, but as captain of the Lord of hosts, am I now come? And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, what saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, loose thy shoe from off thy foot from the, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Brother Earl, who do, what do you think of this captain of the host? In your mind, who is that captain of the host that appeared to Joshua? Do you have any thoughts about that? I always felt like it was Jesus because Jesus had followed the children of Israel and he was at rock. The Bible says that the water came out of. So Jesus had followed and been with them. So I feel like the captain of the host, that means over everybody, it would be Jesus. Thank you, Brother Earl. And you notice how Joshua worshiped this captain of the host. He worshiped him and the captain of the host said, this is holy ground. So Brother Earl and I are marshalling our arguments why we think that is Jesus himself. In, uh, appearing to encourage Joshua. So uh, I want you not to know that no matter what you're going through in these COVID-19 times, no matter what sickness has befallen you, no matter what economic hardships you are facing, the Lord of heaven says unto you, be not dismayed, neither be thou dis be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, be strong and of a good courage. Pastor Mark from Tehachapi, California says to you, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. The Lord of heaven is with you. And we're hoping so much that this uh, Sunday school lesson is encouraging your heart. Uh, moving on to question two, said God promised to be with Joshua as he had been with Moses. That's Joshua chapter one, verse five. God says, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Um, why would this promise have been an encouragement to Joshua? <laughs> you just think about all that Joshua had seen with his own two eyes. Remember uh, when uh, there was that battle going on and uh, Moses lifted his, his staff into the air. And as he lifted his staff into the air, the children of Israel were getting the victory, but his arms started to get tired. Who was it that held up Moses' arms so that the children of Israel could, could get the victory? Does anyone remember who held up his arms? I think. I don't forget to unmute Sister Vicky if you're trying to give an answer. Joshua and Hall. Yeah, it's, uh, so I can't remember if Joshua was down doing the fighting, but I know 
Joshua was there uh, and they saw the great victory that God gave to Moses that day. In fact, they saw all the great victories that God gave to Moses. And uh, I'll just never forget those words in numbers when Joshua and Caleb, they were the two good spies, right? That came back and they said, if the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. And all through those 40 years of going through the wilderness, Joshua had seen time and again when God had blessed Moses and the children of Israel and taken Moses through some really difficult uh, times. Uh, so the, here's our first participation question. It says, share an example have, of God moving in the lives of other Christians has encouraged you in your own Christian walk. So I will start off and give a shout out to the saints in Tehachapi that were here when I arrived 25 years ago. When I came to Tehachapi 25 years ago, there were a lot of Okies in Tehachapi, people that came out in the Dust Bowl from Oklahoma. And when I came to Tehachapi, they were in their 70s and in their 80s, and they were faithfully serving God. I was so inspired by Sister Marjorie Kroll who kept the uh, Tehachapi Church going in her 80s and was a faithful assistant pastor. So inspired by Sister Verda Wells, Wills, who was the first uh, convert in Tehachapi, California, and, and uh, asked the Jensen's to come out to be the pastor of the Tehachapi Church. I, I'll never forget Sister Alpha Smithson in her late 80s, early 90s, standing up in church and testifying and saying, I just want a closer walk with the Lord. I remember her uh, husband, Clinton Smithson, finally at the end of his life, dedicating his life to God. And Joe Wills, a tough man but with congestive heart failure, I saw him slowly walk into the church every Sunday, even though he could hardly walk 10 feet without running out of breath. He was determined to be in the house of the Lord every Sunday to give honor to God. I'm starting to tear up thinking about these wonderful saints, and I promise to give you a chance. Do you want to give uh, honor to an elder this morning in the Lord? Here is your chance. Raise your hand or speak up and come on camera. Debbie Parsons is going to go first. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, the first the first person I'll go with um, that it influenced me was Brother Bob Brown, who is now in glory. Um, he had me remember a, do a memory verse. Romans 12, 1 and 2. And somehow the first memory verse we learn seems to stick forever. And I tell you, that's been a wonderful verse to fall back on. So never forget these things. The people encouraged, and he took me aside and, and taught me some, had me some talks and helped me learn and understand. And it was amazing. It was a really good start to my Christian walk. Tell me that brother's name again, Sister Debbie. Brother Bob Brown. Brother Bob Brown. So Debbie Parsons is honoring her elder in the Lord, Bob Brown. God bless you. Time for a couple more. Uh, Brother Mark, for those who may not know, Brother Bob Brown was Sister Debbie Lee's dad. Okay. Okay. Thanks for, thanks for the connection, Brother O. Who else do you want to uh, honor in the Lord this morning? I had an uncle who was a Jesuit and a theologist, and he introduced our whole family into Christianity in a very nice way. We have services in the living room many, many Sundays with him. Thanks, thanks to him, my Uncle Ruben. Your Uncle Ruben and Marco Antonio, wh where are you from? I was born in Mexico, and I was, uh, I was raised Catholic, and I believe that, that, uh, that I, uh, I am just as good as, uh, as a Christian as you are <laughs> at church. <laughs> And you're honoring your uncle, was it Rubio? Ruben, Ruben. Ruben, Uncle Ruben. Ruben. Yeah, he dedicated his life to, uh, to, to teach philosophy and theology at uh, a university in Mexico City, the Universidad Iberoamericana, which is uh, a part of the Jesuit uh, educational system in, in Mexico City. Okay, thank you so much for sharing that and honoring your uncle. Earl Phillips from Portland, uh, who do you want to, honor brother Earl brother Ray Crawford about 70 years ago 
those that were saved in the 1948 revival, there was a lot of us young couple that were married. And Brother Ray Crawford, which was the overseer, Sister Crawford's son, and he called the all the young couples to meet with him. And I'll never forget how he, he was a big man and a gentle man. And he encouraged us. He told us, never miss a meeting. He mm -hmm. told us, bring your children to church and you tell me if their grades go down. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of things like that, he encouraged us in the gospel. And to this day, I've tried to live by what he taught me 70 years ago. Amen. I, as, as people are sharing all these other names of the saints that have been in my life that have encouraged me are popping in. I want to I want to uh, give honor to them also, but we better uh, there's other questions we got to get to. So I'm going to move on to question four. Now we're going to go from thinking about particular Christian elders have inspired us to giving glory to God for what he's done in our local churches. So the question says, after their miraculous crossing into Canaan, Joshua had the children of Israel set up memorial stones from the Jordan River so that their children and all the people of the earth might be reminded of God's power. That's recorded in Joshua chapter 4, verses 21 through 24. And then it asks, rehearse in your mind ways that God has worked in your life or the life of your family members. What kind of memorial stones can you establish. Now I've modified that since because I want to focus more on our local churches as a whole. So can you give a testimony of what God has done for your local church? Here is the Tehachapi testimony. In 1952, there was an earthquake in Tehachapi, California that destroyed a brother and sister Jensen's house. And you can go and you can see pictures of that house on a restaurant in town. Uh, the house that was destroyed, it was a two-story white house. But for two years, the saints from Los Angeles and other places drove up to Tehachapi, California and built our current church brick by brick. And we can never forget and uh, never want to forget the sacrifice that our brothers and sisters in the Lord made so that we could have our church building in Tehachapi. Every time we go into that building, we think of the sacrifice made of people giving up their weekends for two years in a row so that we can have our beautiful church building in Tehachapi. We serve an amazing God who puts such a dedication and consecration into the hearts of the saints that they could consecrate that uh, uh, giving up their family time for two years on the weekend so that we could have a church in Tehachapi. God has certainly been good to the Tehachapi church. Anyone else have a testimony of the power of God in your local church? Uh, well, I, I think uh, I, I, I'm not supposed to to to, uh, to de tell this story, but the Apostolic Faith Church in Langley, I understand it was uh, purchased recently, uh, and uh, the previous church was on, on Kingsway, a small church, and I think that that I I reinforce my faith uh, every Sunday thanks to the 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 door the. the, the doctrine of this apostolic faith church and the well-structured organization it's so it's so amazing it, 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 it's the sunday school lessons the, the the services and in different parts of the world north america i i really love the, these people in this church and, and i am thankful for, for for god and for the community of the apostolic faith church to give the the apostolic faith church a, a building in langley which is in langley unique. praise yeah. god Praise God. Uh, and I see Brother O sitting here. And Brother O, you have an amazing testimony of the of the work in your local church in Washington. Can you please give God glory for what God has done for you and, and your local church? Thank you so very much, uh, Brother Mark. Yeah, I, I also want to use this opportunity to thank God for um, how the Lord uh, has moved over the years. Um, this was um, when you think about Puma, Washington, I don't think it's on anyone's radar 
10 years ago, no, but I didn't know, well, at least 15 years ago, I didn't know what Puma means or if there's any place like that. But I still remember many who have had to labor down through the years. I remember first Brother Bob and Sister Brenda Bishop uh, driving here to support the work. And well, not even there was not even any work there. They drove <laughs> here and um, we were here and we went, we had dinner with people and they, they got back to Brother Dare that it seems Puma will be a fertile land. And from there, they drove from time to time. I remember many saints, uh, no church, even up to now, no church, uh, uh, no church building. But, but God has given us like 50 strong people faithfully serving God every Sunday. People have to move pianos and move things every Sunday. And they still do that, move, move in books, move a music stand, and that level of consecration just moves me to tears. Every Sunday, as I see people just give their life, give their talent, give everything to the work of the Lord. We remember them this morning, and we say, we God, we pray that God will bless each one who has had a part, not just only in the work in Pullman, but in the work of the Lord all over the world. Brother O, are you still working on getting permanent church building in Pullman, Washington? We we have uh, pray for us. Um, we have little strength <laughs> financially, but God is strong, and we are looking up to God. Well, brother, I know God is able to do more than we can ask or think. I'll exactly. never forget when Brother Gilbert Olson started that little work up in Sacramento, California. No mm -hmm. church in Sacramento. They, they were at a community center. Mm -hmm. Who would imagine that God would take an abandoned turkey factory mm -hmm. and turn it into a beautiful apostolic yeah. faith church? Yeah. But exactly. if, you, if you go to the Sacramento church, it's a beautiful church. And people don't understand that used to be an abandoned turkey turkey factory yeah we we were there a few years ago and we we witnessed that power of god i mean to so we pray that the lord will do so for us here too and please pray for us uh, all over the world as you're hearing this amen now question five is going to take us in a different direction we've been focusing on, on the blessings of god the power of god but sometimes god removes things from our life some kind sometimes god takes away a provision he's given us that's what it's a great question that the lesson writer thought of for question five it says when the children of israel have entered canaan god stopped the supply of manna how do you think the israelites felt when the manna which they had depended on for so many years ceased how might you respond if god should suddenly change his provisions and make the manna cease in an area of your life. So if you go to uh, chapter five of Joshua, we'll read verses 10 through 12. It says, and the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the self same day and the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Now, Joshua, the book of Joshua doesn't tell us what the response of the children of Israel were. But so it's asked their lesson writers asking us to imagine what that would be like. God had miraculously provided for them for 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. They could go out and collect that manna for their food. But when they entered Canaan land, all of a sudden, the manna was no longer provided to them. Uh, is there uh, anyone that has had an experience like that in your life where God has all of a sudden quickly removed a provision that you had come to rely on, a provision you thought would always be there? I'll share one for me. I thought I was going to teach college for at least another 10 or 15 years, but it, it, it seems like God is moving in my life, and I, I'm thinking I'm going to be retiring in just a year or two, something I would never have planned on doing, 
and it's a, a scary, exciting, faith-building time when you realize, oh, the life I had mapped out for the next decade is not going to be the same life. But God is a faithful God, isn't he? He removes the manna, but does that mean he's going to remove the provision for our life? No. So, no. brothers, yes, uh, someone spoke up. Yeah, me, Nancy. Bless, um, bless you, Nancy. Thanks. I, yeah, I worked in a, a shipping company for 28 years and thought I was going to retire there. And it wasn't that great to start with, but this uh, wonderful Christian prayed for us and we st started getting more, <laughs> more one month bonuses. It was crazy. They were cutting back on my work and giving us more and more money <laughs> as time went on. <laughs> And we all thought we were going to retire there, but unfortunately, we were bought out by a company, another Chinese company in China. So um, they decided they didn't need us. So I uh, had to get out on the on the street and scramble for another job. But you saints have been wonderful praying for me, and I have gotten another job in another shipping company. And um, the Lord has helped me to keep it, and he will provide. Amen. I just looked at the chat bar and I, I noticed someone's giving thanks to God who raised up a church from a bakery in Okara, Ogun State, Nigeria. <laughs> so just remember that as God removes some things from our life, he's going to take some little thing and turn it into something great. Amen. I noticed mm -hmm. that Brother Scott Wells has come on camera. Is that an indication you have a testimony to give, Brother Scott? <laughs> yeah, I, I did want to say something. I uh... I think through, through my life, I could uh, probably pinpoint different times uh, where the Lord uh, has orchestrated events where I, I depended on something and God led in a different direction. I think I can stay with Sister Nancy. I've had employment situations like that as well. And God has always come through and answered prayer. I was thinking uh, more upon the passage of scripture and uh, on the children of Israel here and the fact that the, uh, the manna was ceasing. Now, what did they think? Well, we know that the children of Israel had a history of complaining and such. It's not mentioned in here. Could they have, or some, or a portion, have thought negatively? Possibly. There could have been a portion that thought positively. I think as Christians, I think uh, we, when God takes away something, it's almost as if God closes one door, but he will definitely provide other means. He'll open another. And in this case, the, the uh, scriptures just after Verse 12, it speaks about the captain of the Lord of hosts uh, directly after uh, coming onto the scene here, speaking with Joshua. And to me, it's uh, just an example of, yes, the manna had ceased, but all they needed was found in Christ, was found in Jesus. He would provide uh, the way. You keep your eyes upon Christ, not upon the material things or the thing that you, you, know, you depend upon uh, to, to the Lord to provide, but you keep your eyes upon Christ and he'll make, make a way. Beautiful thought, Brother Scott. Now, one thing that's really interesting about this lesson is there's not a question about the Battle of Jericho. Wait, did you notice that as you were studying the lesson for today? It kind of just jumps on over the Battle of Jericho. But uh, I, so I want to say a few words about the Battle of Jericho. Uh, it's a, a lesson we teach to kids in Sunday school. My daughter Jody tells me my granddaughter uh, Jessica is three years old. And her favorite Sunday school song now is Joshua fought the battle at Jericho. Um, I think the great verse, a good memory verse. Uh, in fact, I, I'm doing five key verses for each book of the Bible. And for Joshua, one of my memory verses is Joshua 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 20, I believe. So here's a great uh, memory verse to you. Uh, in this one verse, it kind of sums up the Battle of Jericho. I call it victory at Jericho. So the people shouted when the priest blew with the trumpets. And it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. Isn't that a wonderful, victorious verse of the victory that God gave to the people at Jericho? Now, uh, you, not all of you um, were printed out or were able to get all of the handouts that came with this lesson. I want to point out that there was a one-page handout 
on the archaeology of Jericho. I'm going to hold it up on my screen now. Can you see it right by my face there? So I encourage you to, if you go to the website, you can uh, print out the, uh, the all of the lessons and they'll have a PDF version that gives you this, the archaeology of Jericho. And it talks about an archaeologist that I think it was in the 1900s found uh, the walls of Jericho and uh, even uh, one of them in the one side still standing a bit. And so I just love those archeology. span uh, uh, I'm not much of an archeologist, I don't study it that much, but I know sometimes we start to think of Bible stories as just that, Bible stories and Sunday school stories. And then when you realize, wait a minute, no, to this very day, you can go find some of the walls of Jericho you can, you can actually touch those mud bricks. It's like uh, the people that get to go visit the, the Holy Land and walk the streets of Jerusalem. They're never the same when they come back. They say, it's not just a story in a book. It is reality. It is the truth. So uh, let that archaeology supplement remind you today, the Battle of Jericho is not just an inspiring Sunday school story. It is an actual victory that God gave to the children of Israel those thousands of years ago that they are still thanking God for. Just like the memorial stones in our life, 50 years ago, a hunt, over 100 years ago, God started the Apostolic Faith Church. Those are not fairy tales. Those are not myths and legends. But the things that happened to Brother Crawford, Sister Crawford, uh, they, they're, they're real, they're true. And God, that same God, that Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday and today and forever, he is at work and alive in our hearts and lives and our churches. Amen. Uh, do you know how to do the ASL hand clap? You wave your hands like this. So those of you on camera, can we give a big amen to the Lord for his faithfulness? Oh, that, that looks good. That looks good that we can give glory to Jesus this morning. We're running out of time. So I'm going to jump to question eight, and it says, after the fall of Ai, Joshua offered sacrifices to God and read the law of Moses to all the people, even though there were many battles yet to be fought in the land of Canaan. It's really an amazing description as you read the end of that eighth chapter. The, the battle of Ai has been won, and Joshua erects an altar and he burns offerings and sacrifices and he writes down the law of Moses and he has it read from the beginning to the end. There's still 29 more battles to fight, but Joshua took time to read the word of God. So the question that we're ending with today is, um, what acts of obedience and worship should we as Christians be careful to perform even as we face the battles of life. Have any of you had a chance to think about that? What do you wanna encourage your brothers and sisters to continue to do in their lives to worship and obey the Lord? As I look on the faces on the screen, I want to remind you that what we're doing right now really is an amazing, wonderful thing that we are gathering together electronically to study the word of God together. You do not know how much it encourages my heart to see the saints of God around the world. Life Amen. is crazy right now, but we are praising God. I see Brother Tom has a thought, and I think Brother Adarmola Jimo might have a thought he wants to share. So I'll turn the mic over to them. Yeah, thank you, sir, Bramak. Uh, what comes to my mind is the privilege uh, for the saints of God to be uh, opportuned, uh, meeting together, having fellowship with one another. As the book of Proverbs says, iron sharpens iron. Uh, it's a sort of revival and spiritual refreshment when we gather together as worshipers. Excellent. So true, brother. And Brother Tom Udo from Bakersfield. The thing that came to my mind was the need for us to constantly remember the thing that God has done for us. Those memorial stones, they will help us really 
as we keep on going in our Christian work, as we remember those, and even as we testify about those things that God has done for us, I believe that it will be such an uplifting thing for us in our hearts and even helping other people too to worship God and to continue in this way. That Amen. Amen. And since these COVID-19 times have hit, there's never been a time when we've had to cancel so many services. And I think we're, we're going through another year this year where we're not going to be live at the campgrounds in Portland, Oregon. So we need to do everything we can do in our local churches to stay strong in the Lord. So if your church is opened up, make sure you attend. If not, take advantage of getting on Zoom or whatever technology you're using. Like Brother Tom and Brother Adarmola say, we got to worship God together. Iron sharpeneth an iron. We have to testify of the good things that God has done for us. And God is going to give us courage and the victory. Yes, Brother Earl. I wrote down, never let your guard down. I mean, uh, okay, camp meeting has always been what has kept our church, people from Africa and Australia and England and Norway and all around the world. It, it made us one. We can't get together anymore. And the devil would love to come in. But we have to purpose in our heart, even if we can't be at camp meeting, we're still going to have unity. Amen. We're still going to be one. Amen, I mean, brother. Uh, Amen. He would love to destroy our church. But if we keep our, you know, I guess I said that because even though I'm not very big for a little bit, I took some boxing lessons. And I found out if you let your guard down for a second, you're gone. <laughs> Amen. So we want to keep our guard up in the gospel. Amen. 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 Can I say one more thing? Yes, you may. 71 years ago today, I proposed to my wife. Praise God. <laughs> On Valentine's Day. <laughs> that remind that you reminded me of Valentine's Day. Brothers and sisters, here a Valentine goes out to you all. I love you. The Tehachapi Saints love you. God loves you. Brother O, can you uh, dismiss us in prayer today? Yeah, th thank you so very much, Brother Mark. We, we love you all. And I'm going to uh, just say a few things before we finish. Uh, thank you, uh, Brother Mark Fella. Beautiful, beautiful lesson. Very interactive lesson. Um, we will close in prayer shortly, and we will ask uh, Reverend L. Phillips, uh, who proposed to his wife 71 years ago, to pray for us. We also remember today, uh, Brother Brother um, uh, Brother Darrell's anniversary is today. Brother Darrell Lee, uh, Brother um, um, uh, Pastor in Roseburg, today is the and his and his uh, brother Jack and sister Wendy for the sixth wedding anniversary today. Many people who got married today, we thank God. Uh, what a testimony, particularly to younger folks, 70 years, 46 years, and it's going stronger because that love was built on Christ and continues in Christ. We thank God for that. May God accept our thanks and praises. Uh, we will have the recording of this beautiful, beautiful lesson up on our YouTube page uh, by the grace of God uh, by the end of today, by God's grace. Um, then Portland, even though there's no church physically, uh, I'm sure Brother Dave and Brother Dare will have something played from archive. Uh, please be sure to join in with Portland at 11 a.m. this morning and at 6 p.m. as well. Pullman, um, our roads seem to be a little bit clear. Uh, you know, I think it's safer to drive there. So we will go ahead and hold service at 11.30 uh, this morning. Langley service today will be at 4 p.m. Seattle devotional will be at 5 p.m. Uh, let's, those who can join in, I'm sure uh, Langley and Seattle folks will really appreciate seeing you. Next week, if the Lord tarries, uh, we will have another Sunday school lesson titled Claiming God's Promises. Brother Samuel Oni, who is from our church here in Pullman, 
will be our teacher next week, Lord willing. Thank you again for joining us for this beautiful lesson. I thought uh, when I look around, Brother Joshua said, what a, what a blessing to have Brother Hel Felix, Brother Alan Smith, and many of these elders in our midst. I thought it would be a great privilege to have Brother El dismiss us in prayer. I would love to pray, Brother Mark, but, you know, I, I think it's... <laughs> What a blessing, what a testimony. I grew up in the church reading Brother Hel Phillips' sermon, reading his testimony. So to have the privilege to have him in the same Sunday school class share his testimony, it's such a blessing to me and I'm sure to many of us. Thank you, Brother Hel, for your uh, lifelong testimony of uprightness and faithfulness, love, devotion, and fidelity to this gospel and to God. May God bless you for it. We really appreciate you. Brother Hale, uh, would you dismiss us in prayer, sir? You humble me, Brother All. Yes. Thank God, Thank sir. you, Lord, for this beautiful, beautiful lesson today. Amen. And to realize the same promises in our life as Joshua looked back. We can look back in our lives and know that the Lord is going to give us victory. Thank you for blessing Brother Mark this morning. And yes, Lord. We're thankful, God, for the Word of God and how he brings it out so plain to us. Mm -hmm. Now, Lord, this day to go with us, yes. if some can go to church or watch archives or whatever, we know, God, that you can keep this body of Christ as one mm -hmm. to be with us, Lord, mm -hmm. and that we can have that unity. Yes. We pray now for Brother O to bless him as he puts this uh, Sunday school. What a blessing this is mm -hmm. that we can tune in each week and feel the oneness, to feel <laughs> the family of God. Amen. We thank you again now, Lord, and we ask this thing to be with all in Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Keep Valentine's it Day. Day. My brother, Mark, thank you so Bye, much. Bye, Randall. Bye. Thank you, brother, Mark. Bye. Thank you, brother, Mark. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. You, brother Bye. Mark. Bye. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Bye, Bye. Bye. brother O. Have a great day, brother O. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye brother Scott. Bye. Bye. Rhonda, hello. Hey. Oh, sister Diana. Hey. Hey. Bye, Bye, sister oh, wow. Salama. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Bye, wow. Mark, take care. Thank you. Be safe as you come back. Yes, thank, thank you, you, sister. Brother Robots from Nigeria, thank you for joining Hi, us. Mark. Very beautiful lesson. <laughs> sister Zelma, God bless you. Thank you. You too, Brother O. Hi, yeah, Brother man. Roberts. Sister Hi, Diana. Diana. Sister Diana from Winnipeg. Brother Earl, you picked the dinner for your wife. With we didn't know Winnipeg is here this morning. Thank you. God bless you. For the Earl fixing dinner for his wife today. <laughs> Amen. God bless you. All. you. God bless. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Amen.